Hello and uh, welcome to the Good Food Institute's webinar on our recent analysis focused on the valorization of crop size streams for alternative protein production. My name is Lucas Eastam, a senior scientist at GFI focused on fermentation on the science and technology team. My co-presenter and analysis contractor is Dr. Brian Lee. So for those not familiar with us, the Good Food Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit that is developing the roadmap for a sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. We are 100% powered by philanthropy, and we have earned Candid's 2022 Platinum Seal of Transparency. So thank you all to our family of donors that make all of our work possible. GFI is a global organization, and we have nearly 200 mission-driven members worldwide. We have three key areas that we focus on to drive progress. Our science and technology team works to advance foundational and open access research in alternative proteins to create a thriving and training ecosystem around these game changing fields. Our corporate engagement team partners with companies and investors around the globe to drive investment, accelerate innovation and scale up the supply chain. And then finally, our policy team advocates for fair policy and public research funding for alternative proteins. In this webinar today, We'll summarize our recent analysis report, which is now available online, starting with the analysis objectives and approach, the crop and side stream landscape. Then we'll move to the side stream candidate results for each of the alt protein ingredients. We'll assess geographic considerations and then talk about some final conclusions and recommendations. We'll also end the presentation with a question and answer session. So please submit your questions in the question section of this Zoom webinar so that we can address them at the end. So this analysis was really a collaborative effort between many authors and many contributors. Our, our lead consultant on the analysis was Dr. Brian Lee, who led all of the project scope and analysis modeling in conjunction with the GFI team. Dr. Brian Lee is a food scientist, consultant, and author who holds a PhD in food science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is currently a faculty research fellow for, in the Department of Biology at Pacific Lutheran University. Thank you again, Brian, for your collaboration with GFI on this project. We also want to extend our gratitude to all the industry experts that lent their time and insights, and a special shout out to our, to our reviewers and our communications team for making this report shine. <clears throat> so as I said, the report is now live and can be found in the QR code linked here or at gfi.org, and I believe maybe in the chat. Uh, in the report, you'll also find crop snapshots that summarize the results of each crop analyzed. Uh, and on the website, you'll also find an interactive ranking tool where you can uh, play around with the ranking criteria that you uh, best see fit. And we also have a geographic database of all the crop production throughout North America that we assessed and major processing facilities where processing side streams would be present. So what was the context for this analysis? Well, at GFI, we really think about how can we sustainably create meat considering global meat demands projected growth. And according to the FAO, by 2050, we're really expected to produce about 50% more meat than we currently do in order to keep pace with global demand. So this means more land, more water, more greenhouse gas emissions. And at GFI, we believe that we are at the beginning of a protein transition where Plants and other alternative sources like fermentation derived and cultivated meat products can offer sustainable proteins to help meet that growing demand. And according to the World Resource Institute, there are three gaps between this business as usual and sustainably feeding a population of 10 billion. We'll need 56% more crop calories. We'll need an additional 593 million hectares of agricultural land. And we need to mitigate 11 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions from the agricultural activity. And if you think about conventional animal agriculture, it uses 83% of the world's farmland, but only produces 18% of the calories and 37% of our protein. And so alternative proteins offer a more land efficient solution. Additionally, ruminant livestock account for nearly half of all agricultural greenhouse gas emissions and alternative protein products can significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions by upwards of 89%. So really the key message here <clears throat> is that alternative proteins and global protein transition are necessary to keep warming below 1.5 degrees C. And this will help us feed a growing population. So in addition to alternative proteins, another way to increase agricultural productivity is to reduce food waste and agricultural waste. 
and also utilize these agricultural side streams more efficiently. So this is in the context of our current linear bioeconomy. We currently produce significant amounts of waste due to low value utilization and disposal of things like agricultural residues, processing side streams, and food losses generated throughout the, uh, the supply chain. And so really every fraction of crop production should be valorized efficiently to feed this growing population, especially given changes in, in climate over time with drought and reduced yield uh, over time. So in North America, which was the focus of the analysis that you'll see today, really only a, a small portion of crop biomass is used for direct human consumption, while say slightly more is used solely for other industrial purposes like biofuels. The remaining 75% of that biomass is used for animal feed or even lower value animal forage, landfill mass, uh, incinerated mass, or even left in the field uh, for open burn or uh, left in the field for soil health. So these end uses can usually be less expensive and less time consuming than investing resources into finding more sustainable high value uses of these byproducts. So really the valorization or the upcycling of agricultural and processing side streams presents an opportunity for us to shape the circular bioeconomy, and this will help us reduce waste and increase food production. So this is definitely a um, side stream valorization and alternative protein production working together. And so while many of these agricultural side streams are not readily usable for direct human food, there are many processes that can offer potential to, to elevate their value by extracting and converting that biomass uh, that would otherwise go to waste. And these side streams can yield valuable inputs to the food sector, especially on alternative protein production. We can use them for direct uh, plant-based ingredients like protein concentrates or as production ingredients for fermentation and cultivated meat, such as protein hydrolysates and cellulosic sugars. So it was within this context that we sought to explore these two opportunities, side stream valorization and alternative protein production to working together to, sustain, to sustainably feed that growing population and create that more circular system that we would all want to see. So I'll hand it over to Brian to dive into the analysis for us. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, so the vast majority of crops produced in North America are used to make food in industrial grade oils, starches, and alcohol. During the harvesting and processing of these crops, a number of side streams are produced. These fall into two major buckets, protein-rich and cellulose-rich side streams. Protein-rich side streams, like oilseed meals and grain brands, can be converted into protein concentrates, which are used directly as food ingredients in products like plant-based burgers or meatballs or they can be converted into protein hydrolysates for fermentation and cultivated cell media. Cellulose-rich citrines like straws and stover, on the other hand, can be converted into sugars for fermentation media. These three categories of N ingredients serve as the main buckets in which uh, each side stream fell in. So the side streams were then ranked based on projected side stream volumes, the cost required to process the side stream into their respective ingredient, the environmental impact of growing the crop, and the functional attributes of the finished ingredients, such as nutritional quality, sensory quality, and suitability in food applications. Now we'll transition into the results of our ranking analysis, starting with the summary of our findings regarding the general crop and side stream landscape. The top eight crops produced in North America by volume that we selected for our analysis were barley, canola, corn, rice, soy, sugarcane, tomato, and wheat. As you can see here in this figure, the most produced crop is corn, which is primarily grown in the United States. The second highest volume crop is soy, again, produced mostly in the United States. Here we calculated the forecasted crop volumes for 2030. Most crops had a positive compound annual growth rate of between 0.8% to 3.3%. Notable exceptions include canola, which has a relatively high compound annual growth rate of 7%, and barley, which has a slight negative compound growth rate of 0.1%. As mentioned before, the side streams generated from these crops fall into two major categories of protein-rich and cellulose-rich side streams. Nearly all crops produce some kind of cellulose-rich side stream, which includes straw, stover, husks, and chaff during the process of harvesting. Protein-rich side streams are produced during processing, either in the form of oilseed or gluten meals, brands and germs, 
and spent grains from alcohol processing. We also forecasted the volumes of the side streams themselves. These are grouped as agricultural versus processing residues and further categorized into subtypes of similar side stream compositions. As shown here, the vast majority of biomass is in the form of stover and straws, with a significant contribution of protein-rich side streams from soy meal and corn bran. The chemical composition of the side streams were further evaluated and compared based on their protein, fat, starch, cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, and ash content, as you can see here at the top. Larger circles represent higher proportions of each chemical component on a dry weight basis. You can quickly see here that most side streams contain a high proportion of either protein or cellulose. On the right side of the chart, you can also see the raw unit cost of the side stream, ranging from $11 to $2,645 per metric ton. These differences in costs are driven by the high demand for high protein byproducts used for animal feed and some ingredients in human food transportation, and drying. Here is a quick summary of our findings. As you can see here, the side streams are categorized based on the most suitable end product as a protein concentrate, protein hydrolysate, or lignocellulosic sugar after processing. This is based on the compositional analysis that we conducted. More details regarding each of the side streams are, can be found in the report. Moving forward, we will be diving deeper into the individual rankings of these side streams, starting with how the side streams ranked in the protein concentrate category. This diagram shows the general process in which we took the side streams within the protein concentrate category and applied our ranking analysis to these side streams according to the four criteria of crop side stream volume, production costs, environmental impact, and functional attributes. This gave us two different rankings for the side streams, one based on purely economic criteria of volume and costs, and a second ranking that integrated economic criteria with environmental impact and functional attributes. Here's a diagram that provides more detail regarding the values of each criteria between each side stream. As you can see here, soy meal ranks highly based on excellent or good scores for volume, protein unit costs, nutritional quality, and environmental impact. At economic rank number two, canola meal comes in with excellent or good scores for volume and protein unit costs, as well as nutritional quality, but suffers from poor environmental impact. A more dynamic table is available on the website for stakeholders to adjust the numbers and see how they impact the rankings. Some top highlights in our ranking are soy meal, canola meal, and tomato pumice. Soy meal is understandably a high-ranking candidate due to the sheer volume of soy grown in North America. Canola meal was a surprising second, given that it is often used as animal feed and very, very rarely in human food. One of the challenges with canola meal is that it contains anti-nutrients and tannins that impact the flavor and digestibility, making it less suitable for food applications without extensive processing. Tomato pumice was another surprising top candidate, as there is little research done on the ingredient in the literature. It definitely represents an interesting commercial opportunity for the protein concentrate category. Again, more details about these and the other side streams for protein concentrates can be found in the report. As mentioned before, processing costs play a large role in the overall suitability of a side stream as a feedstock for the production of co protein concentrates. Processing costs are impacted by the original content of the side stream, the cost of the raw material, the processing materials required to extract and refine the protein, such as solvents, acids, and bases, and the energy costs associated with healing, heating, cooling, drying, evaporation, and other energy-intensive processes. Key to commercially making use of these side streams would be the development of research programs that can improve the economics and quality of the protein concentrates. Flavor, taste, and texture are paramount concerns that impact the desirability of protein concentrates in any food application. Researching better processing conditions to improve efficiency and yield of protein concentrates is another important area. And finally, research should be conducted on improving drying and storage technologies to reduce the associated costs with energy, transportation, and distribution. Next, I'll pass the presentation back over to Lucas to discuss the results of our analysis on the protein hydrolysates and lignocellulosic sugar categories. Thank you, Brian. Um, so 
I'll focus on protein hydrolysates first, which are often also called peptones. And these are produced through the breakdown or hydrolysis of protein into the free amino acids or just the short peptides themselves. Um, so we can use these in microbial fermentation and cultivated meat uh, uh, as an amino acid source to support cell growth. And these have historically been used uh, from various products like yeast extract, soy peptone, and beef peptone. So much like the protein concentrates, our hydrolysate ingredients require beginning with a very protein-rich side stream. And as, as a result of that, we had nine side stream candidates that were chosen based off of protein content. Uh, we also included and modeled uh, the production of more purified hydrolysates from the protein con uh, concentrates that Brian just discussed. Uh, so more purified hydrolysates are better suited for cell culture applications, um, since sometimes less pure hydrolysates can impact cell growth. So these included canola meal protein, soy meal protein, corn gluten protein, and tomato protein hydrolysates. Um, so we also assessed volumes, uh, modeling production cost, uh, the environmental impact, and the functional attribute. And the functional attribute that we use for hydrolysates was the amino acid profiles, uh, and specifically the suitability for cultivated meat media by assessing the amino acid coverage relative to the cellular protein demand for mammalian cell culture. So from these 13 initial high protein side streams, we found several hydrolysate candidates based off of both the economic and integrated uh, rank criteria. So here and in the paper, we have again, a, a summary figure of all the volumes, the estimated processing costs, the essential amino acid profile scores and the crop environmental impacts. Uh, and you can also adjust this table based off of your own ranking criteria, whether or not you, you value volume over the other factors or say just purely unit cost. And so you can play around with the slider uh, on, on the website. So for uh, processing costs, we found that protein hydrolysates can likely be produced from anywhere from $2 per kilogram to $12 per kilogram at our processing conditions. And here in the, oh, sorry. And here in the table, <clears throat> Our, our green, yellow, red represents good candidates and red being uh, bad candidates. So you can kind of get the values here within our, our heat map. Uh, so going back to the processing costs, um, again, we found anywhere from $2 per kilogram to $12 per kilogram. And then for our ranking, we adjusted this on a cost per kilogram of nitrogen basis, since there was varying protein concentrations in these hydrolysates. So you can find the ranked value of the unit cost per kg ni uh, nitrogen here. Uh, but please keep in mind that these are modeling costs are not absolute. They are merely a guidepost for, for potential. So we're looking at what's the potential for volumes and what's the potential for, for lower cost processing. So not surprisingly, we saw that soy meal, uh, again, ranked highly for protein uh, hydrolysates for its availability and lower cost production. Uh, and similarly, you can see canola meal uh, ranking fairly high as well. Uh, and then other candidates included corn DDGS, barley BSG, corn gluten meal uh, uh, for their low model processing costs. So we can dive into these top candidates a little bit more. Our top six that we wanted to highlight here uh, with more information in the paper are soy meal, corn DDGS, canola meal, corn gluten meal, brewer spent grain, and tomato pumice. So hydrolysates of soy meal and soy protein concentrates, unsurprisingly, were number one and number two. Uh, these are uh, ingredients that are currently used as, as by the media industry. Uh, they already produce a, a, a range of soy peptone products from both of these uh, materials. Um, so that's a, a good control in the analysis. Next, we found um, protein hydrolysates from corn DDGS and corn gluten meal. They ranked highly for their volume and model processing costs. And both these materials are not currently used as peptone sources. So there are some favorable examples of corn gluten uh, hydrolysates for fermentation applications. In fact, uh, Cargill, they've previously patented a corn gluten meal uh, uh, for use in fungal cultivation. And for food applications, corn gluten meal hydrolysates have been explored by, by folks like Sempio Foods and Cargill. Cargill actually has a pending FDA generally recognized as safe application for corn gluten meal hydrolysates as a food ingredient, but they could definitely also be used potentially for, for fermentation applications. The next one that I wanted to highlight is Brewer Spent Grain uh, for protein hydrolysates. It ranked well for unit costs. 
and it's been extensively studied lately. There's a lot in the literature on brewer spent grain and a lot of uh, research interests, uh, unsurprisingly. So AB InBev and Evergrain, they have developed a, a, a BSG hydrolysate for food applications, though these could also be used for fermentation or cell culture media. So the fiber content of BSG could also be valorized for cellulosic sugars in a dual process, but we did not evaluate that here. Uh, and then finally, tomato pomace didn't rank as well for protein hydrolysates and more research would be needed in that area. So while processing costs are important, uh, an important consideration for cultivation media is the essential amino acid coverage for cell nutrition. So this figure is available in the methods section of the report. It shows the essential amino acid concentration of each side chain evaluated and its cellular protein coverage suitability for animal cell culture. So the values are the actual amino acid uh, uh, concentrations and the red to green is the relative coverage for, for cellular protein demand. So if you look at, at, at highly green values, you can say, okay, this is a high candidate for um, for cell culture applications because it has good coverage of our essential amino acids. So the key message here is that these crop side stream protein hydrolysates can definitely provide the essential amino acids for growth. For instance, soy peptone or, or, or soy meal is often considered for use in cultivated meat media due to its coverage for many essential amino acids. In fact, soy peptone is actually the assumed amino acid source in the Humber 2021 uh, techno-economic model for cultivated meat. And unsurprisingly, canola meal has a very comparable amino acid profile and coverage to soy meal. Others like corn gluten meal and rice bran have a very good essential amino acid coverage for cell culture media applications uh, with higher tryptophan and tyrosine, but they're limiting in lysine. So they definitely uh, provide opportunity for, for instead of formulating cultivated meat media with individual amino acids, companies could use indi individual hydrolysates or combinations of these hydrolysates. So many major media component and food ingredient suppliers, they definitely have the potential to validate these side streams for hydrolysates due to the technological maturity, the infrastructure and the expertise in this field. And so while our analysis points towards areas of opportunity, there's still a lot of challenges for each protein hydrolysate. And so just a few areas of research is first, you know, really you have to um, assess any, any potential hydrolysate and you need to optimize its processing conditions because it can definitely vary by material. So hydrolysis production costs are, are most influenced by the, the raw material costs, the enzyme costs, and the dry matter loading. So you need to uh, be able to assess those three variables. Uh, second, these candidate hydrolysates need to be evaluated. They need to be assessed in different varying fermentation and cultivated meat applications to really assess their, their potential and see if they're suitable for, for these types of applications. And then finally, um, more broadly, discovering and exploring novel proteases could really pave the way for more efficient protein hydrolysis uh, and extraction uh, processes that help uh, not only reduce costs, but improve yields as well. So next I'll move on to, to cellulosic sugars. So currently uh, most fermentation processes use first gen sugar sources like sucrose from sugar crops or glucose from starch crops. But lignocellulosic plant biomass is really uh, an enormous amount of untapped cellulose waste that could be valorized for the extraction of fermentable sugars that can help us lead to a more circular uh, bioeconomy and, and kind of find value in that carbon for our fermentation applications. So these sugars, they can be extracted through a pretreatment step to break down lignin, followed by an acid or an enzymatic hydrolysis of the cellulose and hemicellulose to, to give us uh, some fermentable sugars, a, a mixture of hexose and pentose sugars. So we identified 13 side streams with high cellulose content that could be valorized for cellulosic sugar extraction. To rank them, we assessed, again, their volumes. We modeled their, their uh, extraction costs. We looked at the crop environmental impact and the extracted sugar quality. So extraction costs, they're really most sensitive to the feedstock material costs, plus the total amount of cellulose and hemicellulose present in the plant biomass material. So really side streams with the highest cellulose and hemicellulose content, content were pri prioritized in this analysis. 
So lignin content, while we did not quantitatively assess it, it can impact the extraction efficiency since lignin uh, needs to be broken down in order to efficiently, uh, efficiently access the cellulose content. And then finally, for, for functional attribute, uh, we used what we called sugar quality, which is the ratio of cellulose to total cellulose and hemicellulose content. And this is because cellulose is made up uh, predominantly of glucose monitor, uh, monomers, while hemicellulose is made up uh, predominantly of xylose uh, monomers. And usually in fermentation applications, uh, most microbes prefer glucose over xylose. So we wanted to, to rank um, cellulosic sugar mixtures that have a higher ratio of glucose over xylose. So again, here and in the paper, we have our, our ranking table um, that you can see the side stream volume rankings, the estimated sugar extraction costs, the sugar quality score, and the crop environmental impact. And then just to, to resituate ourselves again, green is, is excellent, uh, yellow is kind of middle of the pack, while red is, is poor values for each of those. And so we have our economic and our integrated um, values. So for processing costs, we use the total fermentable sugar pricing, again, which is a mixture of glucose and xylose. And in our rank uh, criteria, we use this total uh, sugar cost, and we found it could be priced anywhere from $350 per ton to over $800 per ton of total sugar. Uh, we also presented a theoretical unit cost per just per ton of glucose only. Uh, and so for reference, uh, dextrose 95 or DE95 syrup is a widely used glucose fermentation feedstock, which uh, costs around $600 per ton uh, in 2020. I'm not sure of, of current prices. So this is a, a good industry reference point for assessing our top candidates. So unsurprisingly, you can see corn stover and soy straw had the highest volumes. Um, whereas uh, rice hulls and barley straw and sugarcane side chains had the lowest estimated processing costs. And just to, to centralize us, the, the biggest cost drivers are, are feedstock costs uh, and the cellulose content, the enzyme costs, and the enzymatic efficiency. We used a set of enzyme costs uh, and efficiency uh, as our uh, standard processes. So really in our model, the biggest drivers in processing costs uh, were the feedstock costs itself and the composition. So just as an example, soy hulls, they have a really, really high cellulose content and thus a really high sugar quality, but their raw feedstock costs impacted the processing costs. So that's why they, they uh, ranked out low here for, for model costs. So top candidates, um, we found our top candidates were corn stover, soy straw, rice hulls, sugarcane trash, bagasse, uh, and barley straw and hus. So it should come as no surprise that corn stover and soy straw ranked highest, really due to their extremely high volumes of production. Both corn stover and soy straw have been extensively studied as a source of fermentable sugars. Uh, and they have over 70% cellulosic content uh, and can cost as, as low as $55 to $65 per ton. But really, this is this is dependent on transportation distance. So you want to make sure that that material is is close enough to the processing plant. Uh, corn stover has been commercialized and used as a feedstock for cellulosic ethanol production in the United States. So it really does have a robust supply chain infrastructure and expertise. Uh, but these production processes are really not directly trans transferable to food grade fermentation processes, which will require a more purified uh, hydrolyzed sugar stream. Next, uh, it, our, our next top candidates were sugarcane trash and bagasse. Uh, sugar sugarcane trash being the the leafy material um, on the stalks, whereas bagasse is the uh, is is the stalk material after the sugar crushing uh, extraction. So these ranked uh, very very highly, which should be of no surprise. Both of these have been extensively studied for cellulosic sugar extraction. Uh, uh, the gas hydrolysates have been piloted by Amrus uh, for, for cellulosic uh, sugars for fermentation with some mild success, but they're actually currently using the bagasse as an incineration energy source. And then the, the final one that I just want to highlight here is rice hulls, which was actually a very surprising top candidate for us. Uh, and it had the lowest modeled extraction costs for both total sugars and glucose only. And the reason for this is rice hulls have a really, really high cellulose content, uh, which this will yield a predominantly glucose rich extract. 
Uh, they also have a lower lignin content, which could help improve the extraction efficient efficiency. Uh, but one caveat is that they do contain a, a higher amount of inor inorganic silica, which could impact the process and require some removal prior. So definitely check out the report for, for more information on these top candidates. Okay, so let's be clear, you know, valorization of cellulosic biomass for 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 fermentable sugars is no simple task, and, and this has been extensively studied over the years. Uh, but really, we're saying this is still an opportunity area and a high amount of carbon that could be valorized. Uh, and so what needs to be done still? Well, first, each target should be individually assessed and optimized. There's many different pretreatment and extraction uh, strategies, and you should have um, costs at the forefront whenever assessing these. Um, so if we assess these, you need to look at each material and, and assess their pretreatment and, and hydrolysis conditions. Uh, second, really, you need to improve, uh, improve and reduce the costs of any of these pretreatment and extraction costs. Um, and so one area that we highlight here is the evaluation of different food grade cellulose uh, enzymes for their efficiency. So if we can have higher efficiencies, you could have lower costs. But knowing that enzymes are, aren't the only extraction process is just what we have modeled here, but it definitely offers a, a nice way to process our cellulosic material. Um, Another important area is the development of methods to reduce or prevent the cogeneration of in inhibitory compounds like furfural. Uh, and these get generated during the pretreatment of the biomass. So really this can go a long way to improving uh, our processes since these, uh, these compounds can inhibit our, our fermentation uh, growth. And then finally, we need to demonstrate and evaluate these cellulosic sugars in food grade fermentation processes against standard feedstocks. Uh, there's been a lot of research directed towards bioindustrials like ethanol. So in general, more research that's focused on demonstration and proof of concepts um, for food uh, production of alternative proteins can go a long way to de-risking these, these sugar sources. Okay, so finally, for those that are more interested in each individual crop uh, top candidate, we do have crop snapshots within the report. And so you can get a quick uh, look at the crop, their, their side streams, some current efforts, not, not totally um, exhaustive, but uh, a nice quick summary for each crop. And those are found at the end of the report. So I'll hand it over to Brian, who will talk about the, some very important geographic and storage uh, considerations. So here I will be diving into the geographic and storage concerns that impact the cost of using side streams for alter protein production. Here are a few snapshots of the regional areas where the production of major crops are localized. As you can see here, barley has a high concentration of production in the provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba in Canada. However, since barley is often used in beer production, much of the brewer's spent grain side stream production is scattered across the United States for malting or brewing operations. Canola is also concentrated in these provinces. However, most of the oil seed processors that crush the seed into canola oil and canola meal are found nearby in these regions as well. Wheat is grown largely in those before mentioned Canadian provinces, as well as Washington, Montana, Kansas, and North Dakota in the United States. That being said, most states in the United States have some form of wheat production and agricultural activity. Wheat processing mills, which produce wheat side streams, are distributed all throughout the United States. Corn production is heavily concentrated in the Midwest, with ethanol processors and corn refineries set up in close proximity to these farmlands. Similarly, soy processors are found relatively close to soy cropland, which is also centered in the Midwest. Tomato production and processing is rather interesting because it's all localized in California, and specifically only a handful of regions in California. There is a relatively smaller amount of tomato production in Mexico scattered across the country. Rice production and processing are found in only five states, California, Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Missouri. Sugarcane is grown and processed primarily in Texas, Louisiana, Florida, and several states in Mexico, including Veracruz, Oaxaca, and Tabasco. More geographic details can be found in the report. The ge geography of crop production and processing are important because it determines much of the costs associated with transportation, storage, and distribution. 
These impact the costs linked to processing, as side strains may need to be dried, preserved, or refrigerated in order to reduce the risk of pathogen contamination, mycotoxin production from molds, and food spoilage that can impact fair rule sensory attributes. The availability of local workforce in their education or technical skills should also be a consideration, as labor is an important cost factor for processing side streams. I'm going to hand over the remainder of the presentation to Lucas, who will be sharing concluding remarks. Thank you. Get that video back on. Uh, thank you, Brian, for walking through those geographic considerations. And again, please check out the the, the interactive maps. They're not totally exhaustive, but they they offer you an, an idea of where the highest concentrations and potential processing uh, facilities. So I'll summarize a few key points uh, and discuss actions within industry and policy uh, to close to close this out here. So really, um, research and implementation, they take a lot of time. And, and if you look at soy protein extraction, it took really a lot of time to develop, but it's now a popular ingredient in plant-based foods. Uh, and canola protein isolate is now just beginning to be commercialized as, after over 10 years uh, of R&D development. So what may seem like an unfeasible process right now uh, can be unlocked and commercially viable with proper research, development, and commercialization support. So we've already covered a few research priorities, but broadly, you know, we want to highlight that proof of concept assessment of each side stream candidate uh, for food formulation and food grade applications in cultivated meat or fermentation applications will be really important for initial feasibility assessment. Uh, second, you know, what we've modeled here is not absolute truth again. It's more a guidepost for using volume, cost and functional attributes to point us towards uh, possible targets. And these processes, they need to be optimized and assessed for commercial feasibility. Um, next, uh, a big area of need that was very evident across definitely protein concentrates and hydrolysates uh, was the drying and stabilization of side stream feedstocks, or actually the side stream derived ingredient themselves. For instance, uh, BSG and tomato pumice are really high moisture side streams that can easily spoil without drying or stabilization. Uh, and this plays strongly into the cost and the quality of the final product and the food safety. Uh, next, how does upcycling affect the end product cost and sustainability? So really data that demonstrates the possible economic and the environmental ad advantages of this side stream valorization uh, can help spur the adoption of these more circular uh, options. Next, exploring other side streams. You know, we only assess the top eight crops in North America, but there are many other crops within North America and globally. Uh, and there's also other side streams of other processes and even within uh, alternative protein production itself. Um, so, if it's a high volume and a potential for, for low cost uh, production, go for it, assess it. Um, we we, we want to create that more circular system. Uh, and then finally, collaborate. Uh, we want to collaborate across the value uh, chain in order to upcycle these ingredients. So this will take collaboration between farmers, innovators, the food industry, and the government. Uh, this should not be developed within a vacuum, and you need to talk to all these stakeholders for to see that possibility. So before we talk about some policy stakeholder uh, recommendations, uh, let's just say it: the, the valorization of these agricultural side streams plus alternative proteins can really help sustainably feed our growing population. And, and really, this is aligned with the UN Sustainable D Development Goals, or the SDGs, and within the recommendations of the White House's bold goals for biotechnology and biomanufacturing. So from the DOE to the USDA to the Department of Commerce, the National Science Foundation, there are definitely many aligned research areas and policy needs. Uh, and just a few, uh, USDA goal 2.1, develop new food and feed sources that can help uh, in the production of novel and enhanced protein and fat sources. Uh, USDA goal 1.2, develop chemical, uh, biochemical and biomanufacturing processes, including enzymatic and microbial pro processes. This is essentially what we've looked at with uh, protein concentrates and, and protein hydrolysates and cellulosic sugars and how they can be very dependent on, on cellulase and, and proteases. Uh, develop technologies to economically move, store, and process biomass. This is so important for the valorization of any of these materials. That's USDA goal 1.2. 
DOA goal, goal 3.1, engineer circular food protein production systems. Um, Really, we want to see improvements to our life cycle, greenhouse gas emissions. We want to have a, a you know a, a more circular system, and that highlights it here. There's definitely a lot more goals that are aligned with side stream valorization and all proteins. So we've uh, summarized those in Appendix One within the report. So why the focus on these bold goals? Well, they're really important for establishing objectives in the bioeconomy and to to provide focus, but we also need to enact them as well. And so really a supportive bioeconomy policy and regulatory framework uh, will be essential to facilitate the valorization of agricultural side streams for ingredient production. So these uh, types of policies were essential to fostering growth in the renewable fuel sector, such as technology push policies to support them at the early development stage or for market pull policies that really incentivized commercialization. And to enable all proteins and side stream valorizations, we can do a few things. We can prioritize R&D funding and investments in biomanufacturing infrastructure. So these technology push policies can help facilitate the public research funding needed for APs and side streams. Uh, government agencies could expand their funding focus and direct research areas at the national labs that are focused on all proteins, but also on the side stream valorization for all proteins. We also need to facilitate public and private crop value chain collaborations that can help prompt this crop valorization, improve the value chain efficiencies, and ensure feedstock availability. So this could be through research centers of excellence that's, that are supported by government, or through industry development uh, hubs that are similar to the Manufacturing USA, or, or, or local economic uh, um, pushes to create circular systems and, and bring everyone to the table. And then finally, market pull policies could definitely with the incentive to develop and scale upcycling and circular operations. So what we'll conclude with here is that it's definitely alternative proteins and circular food uh, protein production. This is how we can reach our sustainable goals in order to feed a growing population. Uh, we need to reduce the environmental impact of our food systems. One way to do this is to valorize agricultural side streams into ingredients uh, for alternative protein production, like we just talked about, protein concentrates, protein hydrolysates, cellulosic sugars. But there are many other upcycling strategies and side streams as well, uh, beyond those three ingredients. So while we've highlighted potential, um, really this potential alone doesn't shape reality. Uh, there's definitely technical and economic challenges abound. And, and really, again, it's that collaborative effort between farmers, innovators, producers, and governments and bringing everyone to the table. Uh, if we bring them all and, and work together, we can turn this potential into reality. So uh, that's it for today. You know, we'll dive into the Q&A in just a minute. Uh, the report itself dives further into the details of each side stream, the ingredient categories, the methodology, uh, the ranking results, and more. And I definitely encourage you to check out the website and download, download the report in the QR code here uh, in the chat. And you should also receive an email uh, soon with, with the link. Uh, and for even more resources, please uh, sign up for our protein opportunity newsletter at gfi.org backslash insider. And thank you so much for joining us today for your attention uh, and we'll be happy to answer any questions so how about we'll, we'll start with with the uh one here um at the top of the list uh that we have here a, a, a question about the cost benefit analysis using crop side streams for alternative protein feedstock in relation to reintegrating crop residues into soil for soil health um do you want to elaborate on on you know the the weight of either you know valorizing them for ingredients or you know putting some of that carbon and material back into the the earth? Uh, sure. Right? Yeah. I, I, well, we didn't fully explore this particular issue in terms of improving soil health. Um, what ultimately what we focused on was potential side streams that would have been burned or landfilled anyway, and so you know, much of the, the use of side streams for improving soil health and fertilizing, um, you know, there, there's definitely going to be a balance in terms of what's best for increasing the amount of human food that can be produced versus, you know, ensuring that future crop production is, is you know, established. So it, it wasn't part of the scope of this this study, but it's certainly a consideration. 
Thank you, Brian. Um, uh, another quick question here is, does GFI have data on the market demand for these products, like protein concentrates, hydrolysates, and sugars? And I, I think the short answer is we don't have solid pro, uh, demand data to, to say that, you know, if you build it, they will come. Um, but, you know, if keeping the end of mind and, and thinking of the future that you want, if you can develop a low cost um, process, it can then be tangible for for applications uh, for folks to use. And so I think I want to highlight that anytime you're looking at research for these uh, hydrolysates is proof of concepts and cost. Uh, do you have a minimally viable product that can that can show value in these applications? And does it is it cost competitive with current standards and uh, production as well? So I think that one's been answered. Um, so next question, um, Brian, is are there any commercial players you found in your research who specialize in identifying and building markets for agricultural and processing side chains? Certain types of consultants, special ingredient develop developers, uh, any specific companies? Yeah, definitely. There was a number of different companies that I spoke with, um, that I interviewed with. Unfortunately, I have an NDA signed with them, so I can't necessarily mention them here in the Q&A, but um, there, there, there's definitely a significant number of industry players that are interested in using stride streams um, in a lot of these fashion, in this fashion. One of the challenges that I spoke of um, regarding that question was that there's a lot of uh, regulatory issues in terms of using side streams. Um, and right now, pro a lot of processes, um, they, they, they don't consider side streams um, a potential ingredient. So, uh, you know, there's, there's contamination, there's potential for pathogen growth, there's spoilage. And so uh, in order to convert these side streams into something that's viable, um, what's necessary is sort of to engage both um, ingredient suppliers and producers and processors uh, to develop an ecosystem in which everyone can sort of make use of these side streams uh, rather than have them be essentially dumped because uh, they're not viable as food ingredients. Thank you, Brian. Um, I'll take uh, the next question here. It says, are there any plans to do similar geospatial analyses like this uh, for other areas such as Europe? Um, so I think the, the short answer is um, I... I don't know. <laughs> uh, it, it's definitely very helpful to, to see where your, your crop densities are and processing densities are, especially for things that are more spread out like BSG. Uh, and so, you know, if you're going to valorize BSG, make sure that you have a, a high volume um, source since they are so decentralized. So if you can find concentrated areas, that's super important. Uh, and a related question was, will this in-depth consideration of suitable crops be repeated by global GFI partners? I would be interested in a similar study focused on Europe. I, I do know there are, there is a, some interest in, in our affiliates of of assessing their their crops and size streams uh, and and potential in their areas, I don't know to the depth or extent, and I can we can uh, you know answer that offline too um, it, once we you know discuss further. Um, another question for me, I'll answer real quick quickly. Cult cultured meat sometimes requires scaffolds. Did you consider them in this report? Uh, no, we didn't con consider the scaffolds in the report. There's other, you know, opportunity areas, you know, the scaffolds, you know, solid state fermentation offers a, a, a potential. Um, there's, we just didn't assess. We wanted to look at um, what are the highest volume crops and what are like the applications that could be the highest volume applications towards alternative proteins. Sometimes solid state fermentation, you know, it's, it's that, um, how much can you scale it and how much can you offtake? And we're looking for um, um, impact, um, for a more impact, you know, in terms of volumes. Um, there's a question here about um, a general, you know, target dry ton purchase costs uh, for folks that looked at cellulosic ethanol attempts. Um, did we review their target dry ton purchase costs versus the actual that they had in their, in their brief life? Um, I think if, if you look at like the billion ton report by the DOE, um, they really talk about uh, the dry uh, material costs for, for cellulosic ethanol. And it's very um, important to be low cost, that $55 to $65 per, per dry ton, but it's gonna depend on the material and it's gonna depend on that concentration density 
uh, you can't transport it very far to your processing plant because um, that will drive your, your costs uh, way up. But there also needs to be more um, applications to more purified fermentable sugars versus just um, simultaneous sacrification and ethanol production um, and, and more proof of concepts would be important. Okay, a question for you, Brian, here is, mm -hmm. can the composition of seeds or grains, as well as their nutritional content, be influenced by geographic differences? Um, honestly, uh, that, that's a little bit outside the scope of what I know. I'm not a, I'm not an agronomist, so I'm not, that's not something that I'm, I'm familiar with. So I do know that there are some you know, key nutritional factors in the soil itself that can impact um, the production of a number of different um, different nutrients, especially proteins. You know, of course, if you have more nitrogen, that improves it. Um, but I'm not sure specifically in terms of geographical differences. Um, and if there's changes in climate, how that impacts. Uh, the, I imagine that's the this different between different seeds, grains, and, and um, different crop products. Thank you, Brian. Um, I'll take a, a couple quick ones here. The the first here is just a, uh, pointing out that we list canola as a grain, and I thought it was an oil derived uh, from rapeseed. That is correct. It's it's an oil seed meal, and I'm not sure where that that error was, but yes, it is an oil seed meal, very comparable to to soy meal. Um, the, the other question that I'll answer is how did you define cellular needs for, for mammalian cell culture? So, um, we focus really primarily on the amino acid needs, um, required within the scope. And we used uh, the Humbert et al. Uh, 2021 techno-economic model, which calculated the, the cellular protein demand for, uh, mammalian cell culture. And they assessed you know, what are the essential amino acids needed based off of that mammalian cell culture. You can take a look at their stoichiometric uh, values within that report. And then we adjusted and evaluated all our side stream materials based off of uh, their amino acid profiles. Um, another question that I'll answer here, uh, I was expecting to see oat processing side streams. And Brian, you can chip in here as well. Do you think oat-based side streams would be a great fermentation substrate? Um, so again, we focused on the top eight crops within North America, um, though, if you look further, I mean, even pea protein, uh, peas are are not in the top eight, but there's, you know, starch side streams of pea production. Um, so we didn't assess those side streams, but there's definitely opportunity. I don't know if you want to add anything there, Brian. Yeah, certainly there there wasn't um, as much significant uh, volume data in regards to oats, and the same is with peas and all you know smaller commodity crops. Um, and so again, we just focus on the ones that the USDA is able to provide because there's so much data available for for these types of crops. Um, but I'm 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 certain that you know oats definitely have their place. Uh, it just simply is a matter of. Is there enough of it? Um, is there enough of the side stream to make it economically viable to use um, in other processes? Thank you, Brian. Uh, Brian, also um, on a question regarding BSG, um, mm -hmm. was brewers spent yeast excluded simply because it wasn't coming uh, from a crop? Are there any institutions um, assessing it and and how and assessing how well it could score? Yeah. So yeah, it would. Yes, it was because uh, brewers spent yeast is not a, a crop. So we were really primarily focused on crops um, in this particular study. Um, as far as how it would score, I'm not sure. I'd have to look into the composition of the yeast uh, specifically. Um, and I, I'm just not sure about the volumes of brewers yeast and how much it's produced during um, the brewing process. I believe well, I remember it's about like five or ten percent, but don't don't quote me uh, of of the biomass. But um, yeah, I guess there's also concerns in terms of how do you extract it, how do you just you know how do you transport it, and if it's even worthwhile for uh, a brewing company to to extract this material. I mean, there's probably also already opportunities um, to use the yeast in a number of different food ingredients. So that would be something to consider as well. Yeah, I'll definitely highlight that as as a need area. You know, um, 
if you if you if you have a process that produces biomass as a, as a waste in your fermentation processes, um, that's a lot of carbon that goes to waste, and you you need to find value adds for that. And I know there's been a lot of talk of it, but there's not been a lot of proof of concepts in assessing. Okay, we're going to be making these compounds through precision fermentation. And we have our waste biomass and we're going to allocate in life cycle analyses, you know, some of the carbon to that. But then what is the economic and uh, value add of that biomass to finding good sources of, 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 of uses for that, like yeast extracts or, you know, recycling that nitrogen back into your process would be great to see. But it takes time and it takes money to develop those processes. So a lot of fermentation, precision fermentation companies are, you know, really focused on their core uh on their core technology at the moment. Yes, yeah, so I'll answer. Uh, I'll ask this question here, Brian. Um, and I've talked to some folks briefly about this. Is there any interesting data on organic certified side streams for organic certified end products? Um, that's a that's a great question. I think um, that's going to offer opportunity um, for certain materials, like you know, definitely like canola meal. Uh, if you're more focused on the the protein content and and uh, very specific production of of those organic uh, canola oils and then the canola meals to get potentially the canola protein and applications there, um, it it comes down to to volume and partnerships as well. Um, so again, we focused on on volume as a key metric, but those organic standards are definitely important. And I I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna add a little bit to this. Um... I think, unfortunately, it's a little bit on the lower end of the totem pole as far as getting all these side streams through production, um, because it's just another regulatory hurdle. Um, you know, if you have any kind of contamination by non-organic ingredient or processing, you know, that ultimately just negates all of the the you know the ability to certify something organic. And so it's already a challenge to use side streams in food um, because of the the rel regulatory landscape. Um, making it organic is just like another added issue and challenge. So I'm not saying it's not important, but it 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 it's it it would be the core focus of moving forward in the industry. Thank you. Um, there's a, there's a nice question here um, that is. Did you think side stream upcycling topic would be this hot? Is GFI interested in creating a way for the com community to keep in touch moving forward, forums, LinkedIn, et cetera? Um, so first I'll just say um, yes and no. Um, so thank you all for tuning in today, but please join the GFI Ideas uh, community. We have a Slack channel. So if you go to gfi.org backslash community uh, and you can join join there. And uh, we also you know, had a call for proposals this year for, for four different topic areas and uh, uh, more carbon efficient and, and nitrogen efficient sources for fermentation was one of our topic areas and it was very popular with, with side stream valorization. Really great to see um, all those proposals coming in. And uh, just as happenstance, I'm also in Modesto, California right now uh, as, as part of a, you know, a circular bioeconomy initiative and seeing the local e economy here rallied around their biomass valorization and how can they create a biotech hub, not only for biomanufacturing, but for their side stream valorization is actually is so wonderful to see and and it definitely is you know you have to you know you know act locally and you know create the change you want to see locally but think globally of what is that impact that that you want to have and uh, also important to to when you are looking at these side streams what is the volume density what are the materials what's the composition and understanding what are those uh, opportunity areas is so important it's not just oh here's a material i could use but keeping that that cost in mind that volume in mind and do you have a, a a readily available source? So creating those collaborations is very important. So please connect um, and and create these collaborations. Okay, um, there was a question here regarding: Is there um, was available processing capacity considered in this study? Uh, I such as limited available of stainless steel vessels. Uh, we didn't assess processing capacity for this. We just looked for for potential. Um, I will point towards our recent plant-based manufacturing capacity analysis, um, which looked at opportunities and then our fermentation derived manufacturing capacity analysis that looked at, you know, current state and, and opportunities um, 
if any, for, for, for retrofit opportunities. Um, so, you know, check those out, but um, yes, I mean, you're going to need a uh, tankage for fermentation processes or for, for processing uh, enzymatic digestion. Um, um, but, um, so, but we didn't assess it in, in the report. Okay. There's, there's a question here. Are there opportunities uh, for wine production size shames? For instance, I know there's been work on grape seeds, um, rich in uh, um, fatty acids, antioxidants. I'm sure skins could be reused uh, as food coloring. Yeah, so th that's a fascinating story. So we, you know, we looked at tomato pumice, um, which you know, very comparable to, to grape seeds and uh, very comparable on the on the fatty acids and the antioxidants and the in the colors. And I, so speaking for tomato pumice, there's opportunity in the peels, you know, for for the colors, but also for the sugars, which we did not assess, but the the, the seeds themselves are are rich in protein and oils. So really, you'd have to dry it and and have that uh, separated, maybe through like an air classification. Uh, um, but there's a, a ton of of grape seed residues from wine production um, from the, the peels and the seeds, as well as the vines and the leaves. Um, we didn't didn't assess it, but definitely opportunity areas there. And we did not assess um, size shames rich in oil and fat for valorization, um, but there's there's definitely opportunity for um, if you can whenever you can get a co-product generation to maybe make a hydrolysate and a sugar or make a, a protein and an oil extract or maybe a, a sugar and an oil extract, you can reduce the cost of, of your processing um, a, a great amount. Yes, um, I'll, there's this one at the bottom of the list here that I'll answer. How about the nutrients uh, in food waste? Yeah, we so within the scope of scope of our analysis, we didn't assess food waste. Um, we mainly looked at agricultural residues and processing residues, but food waste is a great amount of nutrients, you know, the, the sugar content, the nitrogen content, and valorizing that that material as well. Um, food waste definitely accounts for a, a great amount of. Uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in our in our food system. So anytime we can recycle that would be great. Um, there's a question here about and and Brian, I don't know if you came uh, along any of this, but uh, how would you advise to go about the regulatory constraints? Not all streams will automatically qualify for food application. Um, we have encountered many obstacles. Are there any regulatory authority slash bureau that is specialized in this? Oh man, that's a big, uh, that's a big ask. <laughs> yeah, um, certainly in my, in, in, in reviewing all this and also in my consulting work, I've run into a lot of these challenges and um, ultimately I, I think um, it, it is region by region, country by country, state by state, even county by county. Um, so sometimes these, these are not easily answered in, in one shot. And so it really just depends on the exact you know, processes involved and, and, you know, each, each regu regulatory body is going to give you a different answer just because different people will have their different professional opinion as far as, you know, can this be used? If you use this to grow mushrooms, is that going to be a contaminant in the ultimate growth of the mushroom itself in the fruiting body? Um, okay. And well, if you use this particular side stream in fermentation, um, how much of, this particular you know contaminant is going to make it through, um, and what's the risk of that? So, unfortunately, it it, it is case by case, and I, I think one of the challenges is there's not enough uh, research literature involved in evaluating, you know, what is the food safety profile, what is the toxicological profile of these side streams, and and really are are they going to be up to par um, when faced with an actual regulatory body versus you know, it, it's good to know maybe on a one-off basis from a particular research report um, or project, but that doesn't tell you, you know, globally or or even, you know, in a specific region, is this material um, suitable for human consumption? So I think that's, that's a, that's a big question. And um, I, I wouldn't say that there's any one particular uh, bureau or body that, that could answer that, unfortunately. Thank you, Brian. Um, there's, I'll just answer a quick question here about AI and helping with the analysis. Um, I, that would be great. I, I think I would just want to shout out Brian for, you know, all the great work he did to hunt down all the compositional data, price data, um, that then led into our, our modeling of these costs just to purely, you know, get a sense of all the compositions, 
um, across literature for all these different size streams materials. Um, so, you know, AI to, to scrub that data and get an understanding of from all this literature, what are the values as well as extraction efficiencies, um, having uh, market data on, on the prices is helpful, you know, so, you know, hunting those down and talking to, to folks was, was very helpful. So, you know, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Lucas. Appreciate that highlight. <laughs> Brian AI. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. And then here's a question. Um, do you plan to analyze what the opportunity cost is for using crop residues that are currently used as animal feed that could be used for the valorization processes that you are discussing for alternative protein um, with a prospective LCA? Um, that is a great, great question. So um, the short answer is we don't have a current plan to assess the, the exact differences. I'd have to maybe dig through the literature to assess. But if you look at the big ones, like corn DDGS is, is often currently used for, for animal feed. But um, its content really does offer an opportunity for um, these different applications for, for just direct human food consumption through through processing versus less efficient means. And, you know, we we produce a, a ton, um, not not literally, but um, a lot of DDGS that just goes for animal feed and gets shipped worldwide. Um, we even export DDGS. So can we find more local ways to to process that those side chain materials into food? Question about the cotton gin waste, Brian, did you see anything around cotton gin waste yeah i did um actually there's there's definitely work done on you know a valorizing cotton gin waste into hydrolysates um but uh as far as food application goes it, it's very limited just because of the processes used to produce cotton gin um and so it would be a matter of making it worthwhile for the cotton industry to make something that's food grade which i, I don't see them doing anytime soon unfortunately um, so focusing on what's already food grade is, is probably a higher value opportunity. Perfect. Uh, and then th there are two questions here around veterinary and nutrition and, and, and pet foods. Um, so the more general one is, will vegan plant exclusive pet foods become a byproduct of your valorization and other research ever possibly? Um, I think this is, I mean, there's an opportunity area definitely with, with pet foods, given the the amount of uh, animal meat that is fed, fed to, to pets every every year. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of research goes into animal feed or aquacultural feed and, you know, pet food is going to take a, a slight step up in order for um regulatory, but it's also an intermediate step to applications to human food. So that might be uh, an initial area of, of research where you could apply, say, the, the protein concentrates or even like protein hydrolysates for, for uh, aroma and taste and, you know, yeast extracts for aroma and taste and nutrition for, for pet food. Yeah, and certainly there, there, there are already a significant drive to use a lot of these side streams in, in pet food, especially the high protein ones, just because you know, if you look at the back back of a bag of dog food, I mean, it does already contain uh, brew, brew spread grain, brews yeasts, um, a number of these um, side products, just because they're they're low low cost and and easy to incorporate. Um, I would say one of the issues that I've encountered personally as a dog owner is that um, you know if if you have to keep track of you know the allergens and you know what has touched what and potential contaminants, um, it can be really challenging. Um, and, uh, you know, my dogs already have allergies. So, you know, I, I think it's more of an issue in terms of the regulation of the pet food industry. Like I would, I would actually like to see more strict <laughs> incorporation of like, yeah, this, this actually did touch this and that, um, and it is an issue. Um, and, and I think until then, um, incorporation of side streams in, in the production of a vegan or plant-based food for, for, for pets, um, that that it's it's a challenge there's a lot that's involved in that and I, I just see some comments in the chat that you know i just want to highlight it there is a lot of endeavors currently going on for upcycling and for for pet foods and, and human food and nutrition so um 
Uh, this is not an exhaustive webinar, you know, but there are a lot of great companies out there that are they're upcycling ingredients and finding alternative uh, plant-based uh, ingredients for, for pet food. I think uh, with that, we could probably um, wrap things up. I want to thank everyone for, for participating and, and staying on um, throughout this webinar. Um, we we love any collaboration, so so please reach out. Let us know how we can help. Again, this analysis is just like a scoping to look at potential and what are potential areas and opportunities or crop opportunities. Um, um, so please check out the report and and see how you could um, make use of that, or even within your own regional locality, um, find opportunities. You know, so thank you so much for for joining us today, and uh, uh, please join the GFI GFI Ideas community. Thanks, everyone.